Join me, if you would, in the Gospel of John. We've been considering in the month of December as we've been celebrating Advent, where Advent means coming. We've been considering as a church that when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, when we celebrate the first coming, we also anticipate the second coming of Christ. And so John begins his gospel with an introduction that explains many of the themes of his book, but the most significant overwhelming theme is that God took on flesh and actually came to be like us in every way except our sin, so that then, as the author of Hebrews says, he could be a merciful and faithful high priest, and also so that Christ and coming first as we considered on Christmas Eve, if you were with us, as a suffering sacrifice for us. He came as a savior. We're gonna see this morning that one of the clearest ways that we see the glory of God is actually on the cross and in the crucifixion and then his resurrection. Um, That we see in Jesus what has become, I think, relevant in our world in a new way, we're reminded of the significance of being physically present. Like, you didn't used to have to qualify. Like, if you were gonna be somewhere, it meant you were gonna be somewhere. If you're gonna be at the meeting, it meant you were gonna physically be there. And now often you have to qualify. Are you gonna be there, like, physically be there, or are you gonna be there virtually? Are you gonna be at the meeting on Zoom, or are you actually gonna, like, be in the room? And I think, I'm not anticipating that our culture will let go of virtual forms of gathering. They have a time and a place, and where you have not the ability to be gathered physically together, many of your families, probably like mine, spent time yesterday on um, FaceTime or some virtual gathering with family from another part of the country, or maybe gathered somewhere else in the world, and it's a great gift, but it's not a replacement, not by a long shot of the reality that being physically present is best. And it's not a coincidence that God came fully present to make known his son, Christ, taking on humanity with us. So we're gonna be in John chapter one. We'll consider the last paragraph of the introduction this morning. Um, And Lord willing, we will this morning have a new experience of God's grace to realize again, and maybe for the first time, just how incredibly merciful and gracious God is in heaping grace upon us. So join me in John chapter one. We'll read verses 14 through 18 and then consider these words this morning. And the word, it's reference to Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, that's reference to John the Baptist, and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, Jesus, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The word became flesh and he dwelt among us. The word is um, literally in Greek that he tabernacled among us. Now, if you have some degree of familiarity with the Old Testament, the word tabernacle probably seems familiar to you. It was one of the first places that God met with his people. It is God's desire and his plan from the very beginning to be with us. I mean, let's think about that for a minute, that God's desire from the very beginning of creation is to be with those that he made. God wasn't lonely. It's not like you and I are created because God was lonely and he needed a friend or that God was bored and needed something to do. Like God is love by nature and love by nature desires to be shared. So God didn't make us for any lack on his own. God made us to be an expression of a creative expression or an outpouring or a demonstration of his love. 
So his desire has always been to be with us. And then all through the Old Testament, God has demonstrated his desire to be with people. Now on the backdrop, I mean, picture first in the Garden of Eden, God desires Adam and Eve, it says, um, like walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day. And then sin is introduced into the world, and yet God's desire is still to be with his people. So all through the Old Testament, God makes effort to be with people. Even in the law, God's desire is to be with people. The book of Leviticus says, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. God wants to be with his people. In the wilderness journey of God's people in the book of Exodus, how is God with his people? What does God do to physically demonstrate his presence? Because, I mean, this isn't news to you. We've been considering in John that Jesus is the full revelation of God. He is God in the flesh. But God, all through the Old Testament, makes his presence physically known to his people. So he does in creation. He's with Adam and Eve somehow. He desires to be with God's people in the law that he gives. In the wilderness, how does he physically represent his presence? You kids may know the answer to this. Remember, what does God do for them in the wilderness? Um, It gets really cold, right? In the desert, it gets really cold. God gives them a pillar of fire by night. And what does he do by day? Well, it gets really hot in the desert by day, and he gives them a pillar of cloud. God desires to dwell, to be with people. The next way, in Exodus 33, um, Moses constructed a tent, apparently the most sacred tent of all time. He just set up a tent. He set it up outside the camp, And it was the place that God's presence dwelled. When Moses, Exodus 33 says, when Moses went into the tent, God's glory came down as a cloud and filled the tent, covering the entrance. Because God's desire is to be with people. The desire that you have to be with people isn't just because you're human. It's because you're a human who's made in God's image. Like, why is loneliness and isolation such a massive problem for people? And it is. If you live a lonely in an isolated life, one of the most powerful things you can do is move towards other people. Loneliness and isolation breed horrible things because we're not made to be alone. It wasn't good for Adam to be alone, alone, representative of isolation. And then in marriage is a picture of it. God creates Eve so that Adam isn't alone. Your desire to be with other people is because you're made in the image of God. God creates mankind to be with them. We sin and get separated from him. He moves towards us again in the law. He moves towards the people in the wilderness in a pillar of fire and a cloud. He moves towards them again in a tent. It was called the tent of meeting where God could make his will known to the people through Moses. And then he has them build a more permanent dwelling place. What's the next more permanent place that he makes? First it's a tent of meeting and then it's a tabernacle. God gave them ornate instructions, an exact pattern to build a place where God would meet with them. And then what replaces the tabernacle? I'm gonna ask you not rhetorically and find out what we know. Bible trivia, come on, there's the tabernacle, it's a tent, portable, right? They close it down, they move on, they set it back up. And then they get their own place to live, right? They get to have a permanent place, they get to have a capital city, and then they build one of the sweetest buildings, one of the most beautiful, elaborate buildings ever constructed in all the world. What was this place called? Thank you. Two people have paid attention this year. The temple. Why is the temple so ornate? Why did the temple require an absolutely incredible amount of gold and precious metals to build? Because God wanted to mark the significance of a place where you meet with him. 
It's often why churches throughout history, where they have means, build incredible cathedrals, right? If you've ever had the privilege of walking into a marvelously old church building, they very often have very high ceilings. There's one at the center of Wadsworth, the Lutheran church, gathers in an absolutely beautiful place. And you walk in, and when the ceiling is tall, it makes you look up. It quiets you, it humbles you, and then it makes you look up when you walk into the sanctuary. Because to meet with God is what we are designed for and made for. So he gives them the temple. And all of these things are a foreshadowing to what happens on Christmas. That the word of God becomes flesh and dwells among us. And then after Jesus comes and he dwells among us for a time and he's raised from the dead and he ascends to heaven, how is God's presence known among his people today? This is important. How is God's presence known among his people today? He's given us the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God to dwell in every believer, and the body, the physical body of Jesus is what? The church. Because God's desire is to be with his people. Our joy is fullest when we live in relationship to God. And then one day, it will come to pass, the book of Revelation tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. At the very end of time, God could simply call us to himself. Right? God could just draw all his people to wherever he lives. And wouldn't we gladly go? We long to be with God now. The Apostle Paul says, to live is okay. To die, better. Because he knew he would go and to be with God. If God simply called us to his place, we would travel any distance to go there. Right? You would be on a ship however long you had to be. You would be on a spaceship however long you had. You would do whatever it took to have the journey of a lifetime, an epic journey to go and be with God. But that's not what happens at the end. God comes to us again. He prepares the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and it descends. God comes We are made to know God. One of the reasons I think we love epic movies about great journeys and trips is because we are made to be together. One of the greatest challenges that we've experienced over the past almost two years now is the increasing difficulty that it is to be together. There is fear now about gathering together. And it seems to be dissipating, in my mind, the fear anyway. And I do think that will largely go away. But creeping further into our culture is this notion that somehow to be virtually present is like, it's easier, it's more convenient. Now, you're here this morning, so I'm not picking on you. And if you're watching at home this morning, good on you. I'm not picking on you either. Let's just call a spade a spade. Is it easier to go to church from the comfort of your living room in your jammy pants with a cup of coffee or to actually have to get dressed, show up at a certain time, and feel like you can't eat your snack? Like, who in no, I don't see anybody eating their snack this morning. But when you go to church at home, you can do anything you want. And truth be told, I mean, this morning we got to sit when we were worshiping. I have tried worshiping from home. It's weird. Don't really do it. I'm guessing, I'm not going to make you raise your hands. Some of you have gone to church from home this year and you fast forwarded through the worship. I know you did it. 
or the sermon wasn't really very good. And what did you do? You shut it down early. You're like, ah, well, yeah, I sort of get credit. God comes. There are plenty of reasons why. There are times where you can't be physically present with people. And I'm not just talking about coming to church. The power of physical presence should not be minimized. You work in an office building, and yeah, you could have to walk and meander around the office to go talk to that person, or you could just bang out an email and send it. God came to be present with us. In every way that we can be present with each other, we reflect the image of God because he came to be with us. All through the history of scripture, through the history of life, and one day in its culmination, God time after time after time goes through great expense to be with us. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. Now if you have your Bible, go with me to Exodus 33. I think John, for those who knew the Old Testament, for Jews or maybe for Greeks who had become followers of Christ and were learning about God's activity in humanity, I think John makes a parallel to when Moses asks to see God's glory. This is in Exodus chapter 33. In verse 18, Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will, pro- and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. Your Bible says the Lord, Lord is in all caps. That's a reference to God's personal name, Yahweh. I pronounce it, I am that I am. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Just to be clear, God isn't saying, I have a body, but you're not allowed to see it. He's saying, anthropomorphically? I think that's the right word. Kids, look that up. Good luck to you. He's using language that we can understand, like personifying himself. And he's saying you cannot see the weight and the beauty and the radiance of my presence. No man can. But he says, I'll show you all my goodness, but you can't see my face. And Yahweh says, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall, you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Yahweh says to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Which I'm guessing Moses never forgot. I think maybe God put that in there for our benefit. I don't know, it's almost like he's making a little poke at Moses there. Be ready by the morning, he says, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai. Now there's an interesting parallel here. God reveals himself to Moses and gives him two stone tablets in writing, God's physical presence and then a word, a literal word from God, a word of God. So Moses took in his hand the two tablets of stone and up the mountain he goes. Verse five, Yahweh descended in the cloud. Again, God comes. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, I am that I am, I am that I am. 
a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Moses asked to see God's glory, and God shows him his glory, and this is what God proclaims about himself in verses six and seven. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. The thousands is contracted to the three, contrasted to the three or four generations. Don't read that and say, look, God holds guilty people for their sin, the third and fourth generation. Well, there are natural consequences for sin, and there are spiritual consequences for sin. That, yep, God keeps sometimes, he says, to the third and the fourth generation. But his faithfulness is to how many generations? Thousands! Thousands of generations is God's faithfulness. And when he makes himself known to Moses, he makes himself known as one who is merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious. When we, as fallen humans, when we tend to think of glory and grandeur and power and majesty, we don't often associate that with a character that is merciful and gracious. We would more think of like perfection or strength or success or performance. And here is God making his glory known to Moses and to all of us and making himself as known, known as one who is merciful and gracious. If you want to demonstrate your glory, the weight of your character, consider that doing so as one who is merciful and gracious is far more glorious than one who demonstrates their might and their strength. The husband or the father who thinks that his glory is demonstrated by kids who, who live in perfect obedience, somehow who can, who can force his personality and his will on others entrusted to his care, has an immature view of, of glory. God's glory is made known. He chooses to reveal it in being merciful and gracious. And so God comes and he makes his glory known, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And now look what John says about Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of what? Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is compassionate. Yes, God is true but we wouldn't know it if it were not for God's gracious disposition towards us. And we see this in Jesus. As John goes on in his gospel to talk about glory, he makes it clear that the glory of Jesus is most fully seen in the cross and in the resurrection. The glory of God in flesh, Jesus Christ, is most clearly seen in his sacrificial death on behalf of sinners. I mean, that ought to really challenge the conceptions that we have of glory, of majesty, of something that is impressive. Like the greatest demonstration of a person, the greatest demonstration of a character is in graciousness, is in mercy. 
And so Jesus demonstrates this for us in laying down his own life for us, full of grace and truth. Jesus isn't a little bit gracious. He's not reluctantly gracious. Jesus isn't like a child who is sent from their mother to go and do a thing and they know they have to do it or else they're going to be in trouble. We got a lot of that in our house and we got some great kids. You can make a kid do a thing because they need to do the thing and if they don't do the thing, you make it harder on them and so they do the thing. But not exactly from a fully willing spirit. They're still learning. Kids, this is why your parents make you do something and they're right for doing that. Your parents are hard on you at times because they love you. And obedience is a learned behavior. And when you learn obedience, it settles into your heart by God's design. So God says to all of us, don't lose heart when God corrects you. Kids, you don't got to pout when your parents correct you because it's actually being used by God to form in you a real heart of obedience and gratitude. This is what Jesus embodied. Jesus comes not because the Father says, Jesus, you got chores, buddy. Look at the chore chart. You got work to do. Get down there. Save those suckers. The only way we're going to save them is if you do it, Jesus. Now go do it. No, Jesus is like fully eager and willing. From the fullness of his grace, Jesus has extra grace. Jesus has more grace than he needs. Jesus is like a cup, so full of grace, it's like splashing everywhere, but never gets any more empty. Your sin is not just like barely covered by grace. There is grace coming out of Jesus' ears, as it were. Grace is everywhere. Grace is dripping off his clothes and off his hands. Jesus comes fully and completely willingly to be with you. Why would he do that? Because he is love. And he wants to be with those that he has made. We have seen his glory. Obviously, John writes this after the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And as he looks back on the life of Jesus that he physically saw and interacted with, this is John at the Last Supper who, who lays his head on Jesus' bosom, Jesus' body, like John, John who wrote the gospel got to place his physical head on the chest of Jesus. And when he reflects on seeing Jesus' glory, he sees it most clearly in the cross. Jesus full of grace and truth. So John bore witness about him. John the Baptist bore witness about him. Cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Verse 16, for from his fullness, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Grace on top of grace. When your heart and life is right before God, isn't it true that when you look into your life, you just see an embarrassment of riches of God's grace? Now, when your heart gets a little bit entitled or maybe a little bit bitter, when your heart is not right towards God and you don't think or feel very clearly, you can pretty easily feel sorry for yourself or become embittered. We all can get to places like that. But when we are in step with the Spirit, and we look back on our lives, even our current set of circumstances, aren't we able to say in the Spirit, God has been so incredibly kind to me. Grace on top of grace. I mean, what do you have in your life that you deserve? I mean, this is not in a, very, a very American ideal. We like to say, we, like, we, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. I'm a self-made man. Yeah, I think I know what you mean, except for you're not. You're not a self-made woman. You didn't actually make yourself. Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you came up with it on your own? Were you a hard worker? Maybe. Did you really do more than others around you? 
Maybe, sure. God gives gifts and faithfulness counts for something, absolutely. But when you look at your life, can't you look at your life and say, wow, why has God been so kind to me? The one that I am married to, the kids that I have had, the grace of God to me when my marriage ended poorly, the mercy of God to me when I lost a child, the job that God gave to me that I enjoyed for so long, the relationships that I've had, and isn't, I think, one of the One of the greatest blessings of living into your 70s, your 80s, your 90s would be the list of relationships that you could make that money can't buy. Grace on top of grace is what we have in Christ. The immediate point that John is making, I think, is in relationship to the law. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I think he's saying the law, the law was a grace. Paul describes the law as holy, righteous, and good. God telling us how to live and how to know him is good. The author of Hebrews says the law, though, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. I think he's making the point that God has always come to be with his people. The law that he gave, it was a grace. The law of God is a grace. And on top of that grace is Jesus. I think the real contrast that he's making is that the law was given. It was given as a gift. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came. The point is his presence. Now, isn't it true, I hope most of you had this experience yesterday or Christmas Eve or maybe later today, sometime around the holiday, giving a gift. You tell me, what is more exciting? Kids, you may not yet get this right, but you will eventually, and maybe some of you already have. We have some wonderful kids in our church. What is more gratifying? What's more exciting? To give an awesome gift or to receive one? I'm taking give 10 days out of 10. Well, maybe nine days out of 10. Eight, okay, eight. Eight days out of 10. Those of you who are older who have given good gifts, you know the excitement of watching someone unwrap a good gift. To me, that's the most exciting part of Christmas. Finding the perfect gift for someone and knowing, ooh, when they open this, yes! They are gonna be so excited! Where do you think that comes from? Do you think you have a greater appreciation for giving a gift than your creator? No way! What if that's just a little residue of the image of God in you? A picture of God, your creator, who can be your father, who so delights in giving gifts. The law was a gift that God gives, and it delights him. It is better, the scriptures say, it is better to give than to receive. So the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth, this is the point. Grace and truth came in Jesus Christ came forever to dwell with his people. There is a power in presence that isn't made up for in any other way. Ten-ish years ago, um, as I recollect, pretty near the time I first became the pastor here, um, one of the dear sweet women in our church had recently lost her husband. And it was a day or two after that, I was with her, with another man from the church, just caring for her. We were working to prepare, pre- we were working in preparation for the funeral service. And I didn't ask her a very good question. I wouldn't ask this question today. I know better now, I've learned more, but. So her husband died days and the days leading up to that. She's in the throbbing agony of grief and some of you have lived this, you know what this is like. And I said to her, um, 
what do you miss most about your husband? She could have said, son, you don't know anything, do you? You have never experienced loss and grief. What do, you, what do you mean? I think I actually asked her, what do you miss most about your husband? You doofus. But she didn't say that. She just kind of shook her head at me and said, everything. I miss him. I miss his presence. You are made to be with God. We are made to be with each other. And when God made a perfectly good world and we reject him in our sin, he doesn't say, ah, be done with you. All throughout scripture, he moves to be towards his people. And if you are not in Christ this morning, I bet you can look back on your life and you can see experiences that God, if there is one, was gracious and kind to you to give you a second chance and a third chance. You might be on your 25th chance. God may have been so gracious to you, preserving your life, somehow preserving an interest in you towards himself, that even if you aren't ready to follow Christ, you might have to admit, well, God, if there is one, has really given me many chances. You are made to be with God. We are made to be with each other. And God has done incredible work to be with us now and for all eternity. The word became flesh. And he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Can we pray together for a moment then we'll close our service in song. Will you just take a moment and respond in prayer, just just quietly, just respond to God. came to my mind now, maybe it did to the mind of others too, experiences of how loved I felt when people came to visit me. Thank you, Father, that you have sent Christ to us. And even as he is with you now and we, we long again for his reappearing, thank you that you have left us the Spirit Thank you that you have left us each other. Father, would you help us, help us internalize and live out the power of physical presence that Christ came to be with us. Help us to be a people that prioritize physically going to others, physically being together. Let us not give up meeting together, Father, but let us spur one another on all the more. God, help us live this truth out, moving towards people around us that you have placed in our life. When we were apart from you, you moved towards us. Help us, Father, do likewise for those that you have placed in our lives. Father, thank you for reminding us as we celebrate Christmas, that Jesus will return as our conquering King. We will know fully for the first time His physical presence among us, where all those who had the privilege of knowing Jesus physically on the earth will be reunited with Him. We will have our first experience with him physically.
Thank you that you love so much that you came. We pray together in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.